All right, our next question is going to come from Jesse. I promise I'm standing up. <laughs> <laughs> My name's Jessie. I am a uh, proud Puerto Rican, first and foremost, uh, Army veteran, served as a drill sergeant. I've lived in Pennsylvania for uh, over 20 years now, and I'm proud to call Pennsylvania home. So with all of that being said, I also have a 17 year or almost 17-year-old son who's looking to join um, the military. He would love to go to an academy. So my husband and I are getting ready to send him off to do something like this. As someone who served, I deeply value the importance of peace and stability. In President Trump's first term, he showed a willingness to take bold steps by engaging with leaders across the world to promote peace. Given the current global landscape, can we expect the same level of commitment, proactivity, and diplomacy from him if, re if reelected, especially given that I am now sending my son. Yes, yes, ma'am. Um, so for, first, let me say a couple things. So you said your son might try to apply to an academy. Is that next year? Okay, so the rules are if you need, if you need to go to an academy, you need a letter of recommendation from either your senator or your congressman or from the vice president. And I'll say that while I don't know the Pennsylvania senators especially well, if all goes according to plan, I might know a guy who could help with that letter in six days. So please reach out to us. No promises, but reach out to us. But I'm so thrilled to hear about your background because the bet, I'm actually going to see him tomorrow um, at an event that we're doing in North Carolina. One of my best buddies in the Marine Corps was a Puerto Rican guy who grew up in the Bronx, who actually, you grew up in the Bronx too? Oh, that's awesome. Well, he, he grew up in, in just incredibly tough circumstances. I mean, he grew up in a very, very poor family. He was the best Marine that I ever served with. He's just a great, great guy, and I'm going to see him tomorrow. I'm very excited about it. But to, to answer your question, we are absolutely going to engage in robust diplomacy, robust statecraft, and one of the things I love about Donald J. Trump is, yes, sometimes there are problems in the world that require a military response. Sometimes there are problems in the world that require smart diplomacy, and you've got to use both if you want to solve the American people's problems overseas. You can't just send everybody off to war. That doesn't keep our trust with our veterans, and it sure as hell doesn't honor our commitment to the people who put on the uniform if we send them to be the policemen of the world instead of honoring their service and honoring their sacrifice by treating it as the precious resource that it is. So yes, we will absolutely be very careful about how we engage in foreign diplomacy. And this is you know, one, one of the things that, you know, I imagine most of us are Republicans or at least are going to vote for President Trump. I know we've got a lot of Democrats and independents uh, in the audience, too, including, of course, um, our, our, our great friend up here. And, you know, one of the things that my fellow Republicans will say about Donald Trump's foreign policy is that it was strong, that weakness invites aggression. And that's right. I do think that Kamala Harris's weakness has invited aggression, but I actually think that's only half of the equation. Because Donald Trump's foreign policy wasn't just strong, it was also smart. It recognized that sometimes you have to talk to people, sometimes even people you don't necessarily like or agree with, but you've got to engage in smart diplomacy, and that is sometimes how you keep a war from starting in the first place. I was a Democrat serving in Congress when uh, President Trump was elected. Yep. And one of the things that he did very early on in his term of office was uh, really, really important to the people of Hawaii, my home state. Uh, as you know, we're the most remote island chain in the world. Yep. Uh, we are very well within North Korea's proximity of their intercontinental ballistic missiles. At that time, they were still developing their nuclear capability. They are much farther along today than they were back then. But we had, a, we had a missile scare where we thought early one morning on a Saturday in 2017, every single cell phone went off with an alert that said ballistic missile incoming to Hawaii. You remember I this? I remember this. This was a big news story. At the it time. was massive. 
for residents and tourists alike. People sitting on the beach in Waikiki watching the sunrise and their phone goes off and it says ballistic missile incoming to Hawaii, uh, seek shelter immediately, this is not a test. And, and it's, it's, you, you, you can't really imagine what that is like until you experience it. They were just trying to prepare you in case Kamala Harris became president. That's, <laughs> that's what's going to happen if, if that nightmare ever becomes real. But we went through, I mean, people sitting on the beach, they're like, where do, where do I go to find shelter? That we're here, in, as if we got that alert tonight, where would we go to find shelter? If, if we got an alert that Putin was launching a nuclear weapon, where would we go? There is no shelter to be found. And it was a huge wake-up call to realize that fact and that reality. And so when President Trump chose to go and meet with Kim Jong-un, the first president ever to step into North Korea at the DMZ, as a Democrat in Congress, I was loud and proud to say, this is the kind of leadership that we need because President Obama in the previous four years, I had been urging them. I was on the Foreign Affairs Committee, the Armed Services Committee, urging them to do this, de-escalate tensions, try to denuclearize yes. the Korean Peninsula. President Obama refused to do it because he said he didn't want to reward Kim Jong-un with a meeting. So, J.D., I'm just wondering if you can talk about how, you know, there, there are critics of President Trump who say that his foreign policy is isolationist. Yep. Uh, talk about and tell us why they're wrong. Well, they're wrong in part because of exactly what you just said. You know, it's funny. The people who have been wrong about every foreign policy disaster for the last 30 years are the very same people who say that it's terrible to engage in diplomacy. And it's interesting that they were wrong about, remember how they said that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction? And remember how they said that it was going to be really easy to turn Iraq into a, you know, American-style democracy. And they said it was going to be really easy to turn Afghanistan into a Western liberal society. And, of course, that became a 20-year quagmire. My attitude is, after 20 years of being wrong about everything, why don't these people at least acquire some humility and shut up and stop trying to tell us what to do with the foreign policy in the United States of America? And... You know, the, the, the idea that somehow showing up in North Korea and having a conversation is going to reward somebody, what we should be doing is actually having conversations with people and trying to de-escalate situations bec before they become massive military conflicts. And again, this goes back to the strong versus smart distinction and why both are important. You need both in an American leader. Remember how they all accused, and I've been accused of this, Tulsi's been accused of this, of course President Trump has been accused of being in bed, of colluding with Russia, and yet when George W. Bush was president, Russia invaded a sovereign country, and when Barack Obama was president, Russia invaded a sovereign country, and when Joe Biden was president, Russia invaded a sovereign country, who was the one guy who prevented the Russians from invading a sovereign country? It was Donald J. Trump, and they never talk about that. But again, it's because he was strong. Certainly, some of the bad guys were afraid of what Donald J. Trump would do. But it was also because he was willing to communicate with people and open those di diplomatic lines up in a way that prevented a hot spot from becoming a full military conflict. And Tulsi, you've probably heard the president tell his story, but it's one of my favorite stories of his time in office where, you know, I guess Kim Jong-un, the leader of North Korea, was trying to posture about his nuclear weapons and talk about how tough and, and big of a guy he was and said, you know, I have, a, I have a little red button on my desk that will launch nuclear weapons. And President Trump said, I have a bigger red button on my desk. <laughs> and I, I actually, this is such a profound change between the President Trump, Tulsi Gabbard, common sense view of American foreign policy and the broken consensus of the last 30 years is that we have got to recognize that the best way to advance America's interests is yes to build a strong military and yes to be willing to use it when we have to but also to engage in diplomacy. Why have a military if you're never going to engage in diplomacy? Why always use 
your fellow citizens, as Tulsi said, as cannon fodder, why not instead actually communicate from time to time? You might save the lives of your citizens and prevent a bigger disaster down the road. You know, that, that really, for me, was one of the major driving reasons why I chose to endorse President Trump. Uh, David, I'm glad you brought up the 13 who were killed at Abbey Gate. I was honored to announce my endorsement of President Trump on the third anniversary of their sacrificing their lives for our country because it is essential that every one of us as Americans always keep the memories of those who have paid that ultimate price on our hearts and that we hold our leaders accountable. The most important responsibility the president has is to serve as our commander in chief. Our founders told us that the government only exists with the consent of the governed. Right. We face a no fail mission. Every one of us a no fail mission to save our country and save the world. And President Trump is the only choice in this election that will lead us back on that path towards peace, freedom, and prosperity. Now, before I hand it over to JD, uh, I just want to say that when I heard the rumor mill spurring, you hadn't been announced yet, <laughs> but I heard the rumor mill spurring that President Trump was going to announce that you were his pick for vice president. Uh, my heart was happy and I felt at ease because in the time that you have served in the U.S. Senate, while it hasn't been as long as many others who've been there for decades, you have lived an experience that many others haven't. You have seen the cost of war and you've used that experience in your time leading in the U.S. Senate to take a stand against the military industrial complex and for peace and you standing shoulder to shoulder with President Trump. The rest of us can sleep peacefully at night. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. So, thank you, Tulsi. That was very kind of you to say. And most importantly, it's very kind of you to go around the country and convince people to elect Donald J. Trump the next president of the United States. And we couldn't do this without you. Thank you. You know, I, 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 I want to, I always try to encourage folks to remember why we're fighting. Because it's not red team versus blue team. There are a lot of Democrats, a lot of independents who are going to support this ticket, and of course we're proud to have their support. It's not even just to beat Kamala Harris as much as I'll probably enjoy beating Kamala Harris more than any person in this room. Trust me about that. It, 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 the, the point here is we want to beat Kamala Harris to give the American people the leadership that the American people deserve. And that's ultimately what this election is about. You know, ma'am, you asked the question earlier. I, I mentioned my friend who I'm going to see tomorrow, I think, uh, assuming all the logistics work out. And think about what the Marine Corps meant to this kid that I served with. He grew up in the Bronx. He actually, as I understand it, had, 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 had some drug, drug use and even drug dealing in his past. He shows up in North Carolina at a Marine Corps base as a young kid and again, he's the best Marine that I ever served with. In fact, I want to I want to tell you a, a funny story, because he had he had some uh, he had some um, you know he knew gang stuff because he had grown up in such a tough neighborhood in such a tough circumstance. And we were near a big city in North Carolina. It was late at night. It was probably two in the morning. And he said he pointed to some some guys over in a car at a gas station. We were stopped to get gas, and he said, "I think those guys are bloods." In other words, like members of a gang. 
And I said, well, why do you think that they're bloods? And he said, well, because, you know, they're dressed a certain way. They've got a certain kind of red dress. And I think that, you know, I'm, I'm just telling you, man, I think that they're bloods. I grew up seeing this, and I think that's what's going on. And, you know, I called him Squeeze. I said, all right, Squeeze. Well, you know, what would you go up and say to these guys if they were actually members of the Bloods gang? And he said, well, I'd go up to them, and I'd say, what that red be like? And I said, oh, that's interesting. So what would happen, Squeeze, if I went up to those guys and said, what that red be like? And he said, I'll tell you exactly what they'd say, J.D. They'd say, I'm sorry, officer, I don't know what you're talking about. (laughs) And if you think about the Marine Corps, it took a guy who was raised by hillbilly grandparents from eastern Kentucky and southern Ohio and put us into the same unit with a guy who grew up around Bloods gang members from the Bronx in New York City, and it made us part of the same United Marine Corps and American team. And that is an incredible thing that our U.S. military does. But we've got to ask ourselves, is it going to keep doing that? Is the military going to serve that same important function? As Tulsi said, it takes civilians and turns them into warriors. It also takes people from every walk of life and makes them part of the same team. Uh, The former Marine Corps Commandant, General Charles Krulak, said the most important thing that the military does is it wins battles, but it also turns our young people into really proud servants of the United States of America. Is that still going to happen? Is it still going to have that same function for the United States of America if we put Kamala Harris into the Oval Office? I think the answer is no. So what we're, what we're up against and what we're fighting for is to preserve the most important and proudest traditions of the United States military to ensure that our veterans get access to the benefits that they were promised. And the only way that is going to happen is if we fix the broken leadership in Washington, D.C., and give the American people a president that we can all be proud of. And so I, I want to ask you, over the next six days, I want every single person in this hangar to get out there and, and vote ten times. The legal way. The legal way. The legal way you get out there and vote ten times is you take yourself to the polls and you get nine of your friends and family to join you. So with gratitude to Tulsi Gabbard, the incredible elected officials that we have here today, and most of all with gratitude to all of you for being here, we've got six days to go. Let's vote 10 times, and let's make Donald Trump the President of the United States. God bless you all. Thank you.